Um, so hi, I'm Megan, and I got started in archaeology a little over 20 years ago. Uh, from the time I was in elementary school, I had always planned that I would be a veterinarian when I grew up and do paleontology or archaeology when I retired. But as I was looking at colleges, um, when I was, you know, the same age as, as some of the people in here, um, I actually ended up choosing my school largely based on its anthropology and archaeology program in Honduras. Uh, one day in the field while I was in Honduras, my professor, who had known me since the, the first day of my first semester of college, came up to me and said that she had never seen me so happy and that I was just glowing. And it was true, that, that whole field experience made me know that for sure the archaeology was, was where my passion was and that I was in the right place. Um, while I was in college, and even until I graduated from, from undergrad, I had been told over and over and over that there were basically two options for archaeologists. But thankfully, that wasn't true. <laughs> and there are actually so many more options. Uh, the most traditional career path for an archaeologist is as a professor. And many archaeologists also end up working for or start their own private companies that contract out work prior to construction, like of roads or buildings or bridges. Um, but in, in addition to those kind of more common paths or more traditional paths, there are also archaeologists who work for the Forest Service, for the Park Service, for state parks. Uh, who specialize in working for museums, as well as those who work for historic sites and the state. Uh, I've had several friends and colleagues who have become GIS specialists, uh, curators, conservators, and park managers. Anyway, the point is that there are a lot more options uh, than you may realize and that I realized when I was younger. Um, and there are opportunities in local, state, and national parks with state historic preservation offices um, and with other governmental agencies like the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service. So a lot of archaeologists tend to work in specific geographic areas and have specialties or specific research interests. Uh, me, I am a Western North American and to less to a lesser degree um, at this point, Mesoamerican, which is like Central America, archaeologists with, um, and my, my interests have been kind of the utilization and sourcing of natural resources, such as clay for ceramics and lithics or stones for tools, as well as trade and sacred spaces, which I'll, I'll talk about sacred spaces just a little bit. Um, I've also focused some along the way uh, when I was in graduate school on public archaeology, uh, which is why I've liked working for um, the, the government and for like parks and the Forest Service, this public archaeology is responsibly sharing the cultural resources and the stories that those resources tell, like the what people have left behind, um, sharing those stories with the, the people. So if you are looking into a career in archaeology, you should know that most archaeology jobs do require a degree. Um, and that ranges from a bachelor's to master's or even a doctorate. And that level of degree depends on the job that you want. Um, and a lot of jobs, most jobs maybe also require a field school, although some will accept previous field experience in place of that. And occasionally you can actually find positions uh, without those prerequisites. And I've worked for the, when I worked uh, with the Forest Service in California, there were people who didn't, didn't have degrees, didn't have field schools, who were able to come in as seasonal workers. Um, so anyway, the, like a lot of careers, it can seem like you have to have experience to get experience in archaeology, but there are definitely paths into, into the field, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, like Tris said, uh, people really want to help you generally. So that's, that's a huge takeaway message for tonight. So don't be afraid to reach out to people in, in archaeological positions or who work uh, for state parks or for the Forest Service um, and, and just ask what the opportunities are locally for you. Um, and I, personally, I'm, I'm not huge a huge phone user, but I've made significant connections through, especially when I was younger, just from calling and asking what's happening on a national forest or within a state park, or asking that person on the other end, like, hey, what do you know that's happening maybe in other forests or um, around you, or who should I call? So 
I had wanted to talk about what a typical day looks like for an archaeologist, but that changes depending on the project and the season. If it's raining or snowing, you're likely not going to be going into the field. Um, and instead, you might catch up on your paperwork, your mapping, uh, your analysis, sometimes your lab work, if you don't have separate people doing lab work. Um, but because of the seasonal limitations, many places bring in seasonal employees to get a lot more survey done during the late spring, summer, and early fall uh, while the, the weather allows. So a lot of archaeology is project-based, whether that's for academic research in, you know, Herculaneum or a post-classic site in the Maya hinterlands, or if it's um, survey before a bridge or a road is built, um, if it's in response to a fire or to abide by federal regulations, or for instance, on um, the forest for something like a timber sale. So in the case of a timber sale, we'd find, we'd get the, the boundaries of what that, that sale was going to cover, the land that was going to cover um, from the foresters and the GIS specialists who are again, often other archeologists. And each day I'd take a crew of maybe two to five other archeologists and drive out to that area and we'd set up transects, which means we'd get in a line kind of side by side, but spaced out, get our compasses out and, you know, set them and then start walking while looking at the ground and looking all around. And if we found a site or found anything, we'd mark those cultural finds, we'd locate and flag the boundaries of the site um, in order to keep the lumber companies from taking the trees and even from really setting foot on the, the site. Um, and then we'd record what we found. So really, um, what I love is that it's really hard to be getting paid for hiking and exploring cool areas and figure out, figuring out like how people use those areas a hundred years or even a thousand years before. Um, so I feel like I can't talk about archaeology. I wish I had stuff specifically to show you, but I couldn't find a couple of the things that they're buried in my garage, which it's totally different story, but um, but without mentioning some of those those cool things that I found along the way, um, there's kind of a long-standing joke that, that if an archaeologist can't explain what something is, that it must be for ritual use. But so with that caveat, uh, when uh, when I was excavating in Honduras, I came across this ring of stones that was full of ash. And in the middle of that ring was this upright slab. And beside that was this ceramic figurine that was unlike anything that had been seen in that area. And that was the start of me studying sacred spaces, which carried through even um, to my, my, through my graduate uh, degree. Um, and while I was in California, the forest in the National Monument where I worked had been the site of the Modoc War in 1872 and 1873 where the Modocs had resisted um, the US Army through the winter and the spring of those years. And this like really rough, rocky, lava-filled landscape. Um, after a wildfire went through that area, we were able to record these rock walls and fortifications that had been thrown up during the war and that had been covered by sagebrush and other vegetation for close to 150 years. Um, one day as I'm walking through this little basin, I, I see something sticking out under a rock. And I, at first I think it's garbage and we're, you know, kind of collecting garbage because the fires burned all this vegetation. We could see it. So let's collect it. And I start to pull it out and I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a canteen. I see the little spigot on it. And it was an old canteen and there was this dark wet fabric on the, the outside. So I, you know, kind of knowing what to do, I, knew not to put it in plastics until I could get it to the conservator, but protected it. Um, and it turned out to be a Civil War era canteen, which was a few years before the Modoc War. Um, and, and it was from the Modoc War. Um, and it had been somewhat preserved by being stuck under that rock. I mean, it still had fabric on it after all that time. Um, anyway, so in that same area with the canteen and some of those rock fortifications, uh, we were able to find like historical documents and drawings and stories that had been passed down uh, with what we were able to actually see on the ground. And we were able to figure out things like where specific Modoc families had made their homes during the war and where the howitzers, which are like cannons, uh, were placed in the stronghold during, during that time. I, I have one question. Um, can we come to it at the, the end? Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. 
um because I'm, I'm almost done um it, so as, as simple as it sounds um one of my favorite things too was this undocumented homestead in the, the middle of this specific valley um and there was very little left of the buildings um but to be able to like stand there where there was this platform and where the fence had fallen down and just like little pieces of wood, but standing there alone in this huge open valley um, and thinking about like who had moved out here all that time um, before, what they had brought with them, how they built their home, how they got what they needed and pondering those questions and thinking about people in the past and what it may have been like to be them and sometimes getting like some parts of those questions from the remains that they had left behind is, is really why I love archeology. span Like, I think it's so cool to start to answer those questions.